Young's Modulus. This is the big boy of ENES 102. It's one of the most important letters you're going to learn in this whole class. It's the letter E. And what Young's Modulus is, is it's essentially the stiffness of an elastic material. It's going to allow you to relate the force that a material is subjected to, to how much it stretches. The equation for Young's Modulus is tensile stress over tensile strain. So to give you a little silly graphic, it's stress ah, over strain, which there we go, we've got a strainer. Now, we've learned about stress, but we haven't yet talked about strain. So let me show you what that equation is, a little bit more on this slide, and then we'll explain it even further moving forward. Effectively, we've got the equation for Young's Modulus as stress over strain. We know that stress is represented by sigma, and what strain will be represented by is epsilon. Now stress, we know, is pressure. It's force over area. What strain is, is it's change in length over initial length. And if you kind of rearrange the equation so that you don't have fractions on top and bottom, you get the following. But usually we think of Young's modulus as being the stress of a material over the strain of a material that it's experiencing at a given time. And eventually what I'll show you is that we graph Young's modulus. And it's going to be different for every material. And we're going to explain a little bit more about what exactly it means. Let me explain a little bit more about strain and what it's all about. Take the sample of wood that's shown below, which has an initial length, L0. If I apply a force to both ends of that wood, and I pull, what do you think will happen? It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that that wood is going to get larger. It's going to stretch out as you pull it. And its final length might be LF. Well, comparing the final length to the initial length, you'll find that there was a change in length, that the material got larger. And this will also be true in a material that's getting squished. The change in L wouldn't be an increase in distance, but it would actually be a decrease in the length of the material. So what our equation for strain is, is that epsilon is equal to the change in length of a material over L0. And as I was saying, strain will be a negative value if a material is in compression, because the change in length will be negative, it'll be decreasing, and strain will be positive if a material is in tension, as in the material will actually get stretched and get longer. And it's important to recognize that strain has no units. It is just a percentage. Because we have change in length over length, the units for length, whatever they might be, will cancel out, and we're left with just a percentage change in the material's length. So to explain a bit more about what the physical meaning of Young's modulus is, I like to take the equation, which is stress over strain, and kind of relate it to this idea of force per stretchiness. So, if you think about a material that has a high Young's modulus, or a high E, one way to think about that is that it takes a lot of force to stretch the material. So that's a way that a material can have a very high Young's modulus. Another way to think about it is that if a material has a very low value of stretchiness, it's not very stretchy, then it'll also tend to have a higher value of Young's modulus as well. And this kind of makes sense because if you look it up on Wikipedia, Young's modulus is referred to as the mechanical property that measures the stiffness of a material. So the higher the Young's modulus, the stiffer a material you have. So let's look at some examples of Young's modulus for different materials and try and figure out what this means. So here you can see a table of different values of Young's modulus for different materials. If you look at steel versus aluminum, you know, just looking at those two materials, what do we know about steel versus aluminum? Probably most people would think, oh, steel is stronger than aluminum. And in a way, that's kind of true. Steel has a value of Young's modulus that's much higher than that of aluminum, almost by an order of magnitude. Now, what that actually means is that when you apply force to steel versus when you apply that same force to aluminum, the aluminum will tend to stretch more than the same amount of steel would under those same loading conditions. So a lower value of Young's modulus means the material is less stiff or that it's more stretchy, pretty much. And if you look at one of the weird things on this graph here, you see air is listed. And if you look at the Young's modulus of air, it's very low. And you might think, what? Who's building a structure out of air? Well, really what this is, is if you put air in a container and you compress the container, the, the air is very compressible, right? That's why it has a very low value of Young's modulus. It's 
air in, in a way is very stretchy. So where does that table come from? How do we know Young's modulus for pretty much every material in the world? Well, the way that it was found was someone had to go into the lab and do tests. You actually take a material and you pull it apart and you do a tensile test. Similarly, you can also test materials in compression. Now what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take you on a little lab tour to the University of Maryland Woodshop and show you one of these tests in person and show you what you get out of that test. Hey everyone, I'm here in the J.M. Patterson building in the woodshop to teach you a little bit more about materials testing. Now what I've got here is a good old fashioned materials testing specimen. And what you can see, if you look more closely, what you'll see is that the center of it has a much smaller cross-sectional area than the two ends. This is why this is commonly referred to as a dog bone specimen. Woof woof! Because it actually looks like a dog bone. The reason that's the case is because in the material testing machine, you need to grip the material very tightly at both ends. This would actually develop a different type of stress in the end conditions and as a result, your material would be more likely to fail where it's being squeezed in the testing machine. By making the middle smaller, we will concentrate the greatest stress in the middle. And we know that the middle point will be the point that's most likely to fail. As a result, we can rest assured knowing that the material will fail under the proper loading conditions due to tension and not due to the over-gripping stresses developed in the two ends. What you see here are the two materials testing machines that we have in the wood shop. This machine right here tests specimens in tension, and the machine over there tests specimens in compression or in bending. The way that both of these machines work is behind these metal grates here are actually large screws. They're controlled by a DC motor at the top or the bottom that actually spins the screw and controls this mechanism right here, which moves up or down. The machine is equipped with a sensor and this sensor detects force that's being applied to the specimen. Together, using both the position of the arm and the force that's detected, our computer system over here, which is usually quite dusty because we're in a wood shop, actually relates those two things and can develop a stress-strain curve depending on the inputs that you give it and can tell you the overall strength of the material. And I'm going to show you one of those tests right now. What you can see now is that we've got the wood clamped into the material testing machine we're going to now set up the computer and run the test. And I'll let you zoom in to this portion over here so that you can see the graph that we're generating. What I'll do in this program now is generate a graph for force in newtons versus change in position or how much the material is stretching shown in millimeters. By coming down over here, I'll click the play and then you can see what happens. What you can see happening right now is that we've got a force shown over here. This shows how much force is being applied to our wood specimen. And we're also showing the change in position, how much it's stretched. We're doing this all relative to a time, and that's what we're graphing over here. So we're graphing the force versus the position. And you see this linear line right over here, that is Young's modulus. It's more or less the stress over the strain. The graph will continue to go up and up and up, and eventually what we'll see and observe is the graph fail. All right, what you can see has happened is that, one, I got a little bit bored because I realized I made the materials testing machine move way too slow. So that's why there was that discontinuity in the graph. I decided to raise the speed at which it was pulling the specimen apart. But aside from that, what you can see now is that our wood specimen failed at around 11 or 1200 pounds of force. So this little tiny piece of wood, extremely, extremely small in cross section, was able to hold almost 10 people. That's insane. Wood is extremely strong, especially when you load it with the grain. Now, the way that you can see how this material failed is it's split right down the middle. And if I kind of can zoom this in here, so if you look at the wood specimen now, 
what you can see is one, how many grip marks there are on the end conditions. This is why we have dog bone specimens, because you can see how tight the grips were on the ends. And what you can also see is that this wood was because it was pulled along the grain, essentially just split and pulled all the fibers along relative to each other. And you can see that represented in this piece of wood right here. I could actually take these two pieces of wood pretty much and align them perfectly with each other and you'd almost not be able to tell that the specimen even failed. Well, there you have it. I just showed you a basic material specimen test. You might be wondering now, why do we still do those tests? Don't we already know everything about materials, how strong wood and concrete and steel is? What's the point of uh, doing materials tests anymore? Well, the truth of the matter is that all the materials strength data you find for materials out there is, in a way, a lie. Not really, but it's an average for that material overall. When you're testing steel or concrete, you might be given a Young's modulus, but that's the average value. So what you always need to do is when you're doing your own job, you need to test that concrete on the site because the given environmental conditions or the way that the steel is manufactured on a given day may actually result in a different strength or a different Young's modulus. So it's always important to test your materials in the moment to make sure that they're meeting the design that the engineer set out to create. Additionally, all sorts of new materials are de being developed all the time. We actually had a student in here do a research project where he brought in 3D printed materials. What he was testing was how did 3D printed material strength vary depending on environmental conditions. So we actually took 3D printed specimens, put them in a river, a lake, in the ocean, buried them in sand, and left them there for different periods of time. He came back and tested all those specimens to see what had the most detrimental effects on the strength of the material. Or was 3D printed filament a good choice for the river or the lake? Or did you really need to use something else? So materials testing is still important today due to the irregularity in materials and the fact that we're developing new materials all the time. In our little lab tour, what you were able to see is that I was able to generate the stress strain curve or the force versus displacement graph for the wood specimen that I was showing you. Typically for all specimens you'll generate a graph that looks like the one below. And Young's modulus is always going to be the initial slope of that graph before the material starts to really deform and get messed up. So the tangent modulus is kind of what the slope of the stress strain curve is at any given point. The initial portion of the graph the tangent modulus is going to be the same as Young's modulus, which is again just measuring the stiffness of the material. Now let's do an example here where we look at four different materials, one in blue, one in red, one in green, and one in purple. Or maybe that's violet or mauve, I'm not sure. What we can do is think through this idea of Young's modulus, that it's explaining how stiff a material is. If it's a very high value of Young's modulus, we know that the material is stiff. If it's very low, we know that it's very stretchy. And we know that Young's modulus is the slope of the stress-strain graph. So look at these examples right here, the blue, red, green, and purple materials, and think for a little while about what these graphs may represent. What type of material? And what I mean by that is, you know, what type of material would the blue material be? Like what would be an example of that material? Similarly, what would be an example of the purple material shown at the bottom? What would exhibit that behavior of the stress strain curve? So pause your video and think through this a little bit. Okay, let's go over the answer. In my opinion, a good way to think about this is something that we discussed earlier on in the class, which is extreme case reasoning. Let's look at the two most extreme graphs, the blue one and the purple one. What we know about Young's modulus, as I was saying, is that if it has a very low value of Young's modulus, the material is very stretchy. So the purple material is actually the easiest one to think about first. And what that material is referred to is as a plastic material. And an example of that might be rubber. It takes very little force to stretch the material some distance. Now what would be the opposite of a rubber? The opposite of rubber would be something like glass. And we refer to the blue slope as a brittle material, something that 
you know, might be fairly strong, but doesn't deform at all and will break suddenly. So something like glass or peanut brittle or possibly ceramics. Now, if we look at the red and the green graphs, that's a little bit interesting. The red graph, as you can see, is a little bit stretchier of a material, but the, the Young's modulus is still quite high. That would be an example of a strong material which is not ductile, and a good example of that is something like, like metal. Metal is very strong, and it does stretch, but it still will break fairly suddenly. Like, you're not going to have some steel cable stretch feet and feet and feet, like a rubber cable might or something but it still does exhibit properties of stretchiness much more so than a brittle material like glass. Now the green material is actually very, very interesting to look at. And why I say that is because its stress strain curve is very unique. If we look at the green material, what we can see is that the material gets loaded for a while. It's going up and up and up and up. We've got a Young's modulus. It's happy, but then all of a sudden it fails it actually gets weaker for a while and the graph starts to go down. But just like a Disney movie, when their hero of our movie is down, he picks himself back up and gets even stronger. And as you can see, the stress strain curve goes up and up and up and up and up and up right there. And then eventually he fails, he's defeated and <laughs> his stress strain curve goes down on the other side almost a happy ending. But why this actually happens is that the material it starts to kind of like get pulled past itself, it fails, but then the material like realigns itself and then actually for a little while gets stronger until it actually gets pulled apart. And what this is called is it's called a ductile material. It's a material that's a lot stretchier and it exhibits this really strange and interesting uh, realignment of interior particles that actually makes it stronger for a little while but eventually it does still fail. So ultimately, Young's modulus and the stress strain curve will show you how much material stretches relative to how much force is applied to it. And ultimately what it will reveal to you is the strength of a material when it fails. So usually the end of a stress strain curve is when the material broke in half and couldn't support any more load. Let's take a look at some different examples here where we've got a material and we're pulling it apart and it failed in either way A, B, or C. Using what you know now about brittle, ductile, plastic materials, I want you to think about what type of material material A, B, and C were if these are the materials that were tested and then failed. So pause your video and think about this for just a second and then I'll reveal the answers. Okay. If we look at the answers to this question here, the ductile material, completely ductile material, and brittle material. The ductile material would be kind of something like in the middle, and in this case it turns out to be it's B. It is the middle one. If we look at the completely ductile material, that's going to be C. It basically got smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller in the cross section and eventually just pulled apart. But it stretched quite a bit before it actually failed, so we would say that that's completely ductile. If we look at a brittle material, a brittle material is something that fails suddenly with almost no stretch. So A would be a very good example of a brittle material. So if we look at this graph here, it sometimes can be a little tricky, but this is really kind of the life of a material over its stress strain curve. And let me explain a little bit more about what this means. The most important region is this region over here, region 1. We refer to this as the linear elastic region. You're going to oftentimes see this in homework and group work and other problems where you're assuming that the material is being loaded in this region. The reason why is because up here at the top, what you can see is that you have this value of sigma y listed. And what that represents is it's the yield stress of the material. And the reason the yield stress is so significant is because once your material passes this point right here, that is the point of no return. Your material will be permanently stretched some amount or permanently squished some amount past that point. The point before that point, all of the graph before that, is totally fine. So if we look right here, this portion of the graph is okay. This is where we get Young's modulus E from. And basically what this means is that if you, you can apply that much stress to the material and then stop, 
and the material will go back just like nothing ever happened. It'll be totally fine. But once you exceed that yield stress, the material will never be the same. It's permanently deformed. In the second region of our graph, we refer to this as the plastic region. And what the plastic region is, is it's when the material is deformed permanently and it's stretching and stretching or squishing and squishing even more and more. And ultimately what will happen is that the graph will kind of top out and then start to go down. And this is what we refer to as the ultimate stress. It's the highest point of stress that a material will exhibit before the stress it's experiencing starts to go down. Now something that I think confuses people a lot, and probably it's going to be hard to explain this a little bit over this PowerPoint, but really what's happening is that the stress for material always goes up. But if you remember what the equation for stress is, stress is force over area. What happens when a material is getting stretched out is that the cross-sectional area is getting smaller. And when you've got the material's area getting smaller, the stress would actually increase as the material's loaded. But what we actually do in this graph here is engineers, you don't care about the area changing. You hope you never got to that point in the first place, which is why the area only actually changes after you reach the yield stress. So as an engineer, you design the initial area so that you never exceed this point here, hopefully. But if you do, you keep the initial area the same in your calculation of stress, but in real life, the stress is actually decreasing. The last portion of our graph over here is what we call the necking region. This is where the material gets smaller and smaller and smaller and eventually fails at the point of fracture. That's it. Just to reiterate, the yield stress is such an important point because the yield stress essentially means the point of no return. When you've loaded your material past a certain point, you can see in the examples here, in the spoon and in the spring, if you pull them too much, the material will be deformed forever. When you stop loading it, it won't go back to the way it was before. And this is exactly why permanent deformation is considered a failure in your structure. You can imagine if you built a building and after some load it was crooked, you wouldn't say, oh, it's still standing, the building's fine. Because once the building's crooked, it's not the initial design you had anymore. So permanent deformation is yield stress, and that's why we always in our problems will consider that the point of failure rather than something like the ultimate stress. All right, everyone, that's the end of today's lecture content. Hopefully you found this both entertaining and informative, as material properties are the foundation of engineering systems in the real world.